Psalms 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. You know, there's protocol if you would ever even want to go see the president. I wouldn't mind going to see it. Maybe you would. But if you was to have a notion to go, you'd have to go through photo protocol. Certain places you'd have to go and certain things you carry, you know, probably wouldn't let you carry both or a uh, pocket knife from it. But uh, certain things you do. I, certain things that if you see the Queen, I think our president met the Queen not too long ago, you know, right before the June 6th uh, uh, invasion of Normandy, uh, 75th anniversary, we went back to see the Queen. And I think, uh, you're not supposed to touch her, but I think he slipped up and touched her, I think, with his arm around her or something. So I heard him talking about that. It's protocol, it's things that you can do. But if, if you know, we, we would respect uh, nation's head like the queen or a president, if we would honor that protocol, how much more should we honor the protocol God has given us? And I think this Psalms 100, I think it touches all the bases. We just come before it with singing, serving with gladness, hallelujah, amen. Know that if it is coming in the gates, it's beginning to thank God, hallelujah. Somebody said, well, what I got to thank you for? Thank you because if your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're not going to hell, but you're going to heaven. Woo! Isn't that something good? Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Thank you guys for praying. Thank you for please take a prayer list with you home today, will you? Uh, I tell you, God is working, God is moving, uh, He's blessing, He's healing, He's touching folks. Lives are changing because you're praying. Uh, prayer does work. It's not just, you're not just shadow boxing in the air. God said, call upon me and I'll answer you. Show me my things that you know not of. So prayer does work. You know, sometimes we want it to work a little faster. Sometimes we, we you know, can try to tell God what, how to do it. But we just need to come before him and say, God, here's Here's the need. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. Praise God. Hallelujah. I've got a future. We've got a future. Hey, with God. We do. For a text today, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. And I, I think we're in a, a vein of, uh, we're digging this, this good praise and this good worship. Uh, I think we do need a revival of uh, joy and rejoicing. I think if our church would really begin to, to dig in and get serious about having joy with God and rejoicing with God and coming together, praising His holy name. With, you know, like the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and have all that is within me. Have we given him his all? Have we given him our all today? Probably not. But uh, maybe we've given him a little more than we did in my week. And so we're going to grow. We're going to grow together. We're going to learn together. Because I can see the day in my mind's eye, in my faith's eye, I can see the day that the Shekinah glory of God is going to set upon this church, set upon this congregation, Without anybody, without anybody even laying hands on people, the 
glory of God is going to come down and every sickness, every problem, every difficulty, God is going to intervene and He's going to show up and He's going to show out and we're going to give Him 120% of the credit for what He does. Isn't that right? That's what we need to do. I really believe that in my heart. But this is 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 19 and 20. It says, uh, what? Paul was talking to the Corinthians. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For we're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Amen. Stretch your hand and pray for the pastor this morning. Father, we love you today. Thank you, God, for every blessing that we've already received. And we felt your presence today, God. And we're excited about knowing, Lord, that we know that you're Lord. We know that living you love us. Dying you saved us. Buried you took our sins from our way. Rising you justified and freed us forever. One day, could be today, Jesus is coming back. Oh, yes, he is. In Jesus' name. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor. Amen. Our pastor, need all your help, all your amen, all your praises. Hallelujah. And everybody said, amen. amen. Preach. If I go to sleep up here, he's throw something at me, okay? Hallelujah. We had one lady come to church one time, and uh, some of you will remember it. Uh, she had a cell phone, and I guess she was she was a little, an older generation, and she probably didn't understand about cell phone. But cell phone kept ringing. And she didn't know how to stop it. She was sitting about three rows back there, and she just told us that we were on the stage. <laughs> she throw it up there, so, you know. Things have been thrown up here before, so uh, I used to be a pretty good catcher, but I don't know. I'm maybe not as good as I thought I was. Anyway. Praise God. Lord, in thy presence, the Bible tells us we're in this vein of rejoicing and joy. We need revival of rejoicing and revival of joy. Life's sweet. We talked about that. We talked about the Psalms. The Psalmist said in Psalm 16 and 11, In thy presence, O God, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. The word uh, we told you last week, the word rejoice is joy. Both of those words throughout the word of God is 367 times are the word rejoice or joy. Both of them tied together. And look today, I thought about also the word weeping. You know the Bible says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. But the word weeping or weep is found 100 times throughout the Bible. Oh, uh, yes, there's times, there's times of lowness. We go through valleys. We go through times of uh, we're not as up as we are at other times. We can't stay. You can't stay on the mountaintop all the time. Amen. You, you know, you've got to go up and down. That's sort of the cycle of life. People do that. But uh, know this, that if you get in the valley, you know, if the devil's kicking your shins, amen, if he's trying to eat your lunch and trying to get you to doubt and pout, know this, that Troubles don't last always. God is a God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly. Weeping may endure for the night, but what comes in the morning? Joy comes in the morning. Praise God. The psalmist David said in Psalms 119 and 71, he said, it's good for me that I was afflicted. Good for me that I was afflicted. I want us to turn there if you had your Bibles and Let's look at that. Uh, Psalms 119, 71. It's good for me that I have been afflicted, 
that I may learn, that I might learn thy statutes. But back up and look at verse 67. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. You know, if we're going the wrong direction, God's our loving Heavenly Father. He's, he's full of grace and full of mercy. But at the same time, He's also our Daddy God. And He, he knows how to whoop us. Amen. Uh, we used to get whoopings. You know, they don't give them out too much anymore. We used to get them at school. We used to get them at home. My mother was the whipper, mostly at our house. Our dad worked usually 14 hours a day. Wintertime things, he was home more in the wintertime, and he was uh, you know, up and out early and in late. And uh, so he never did have to really bear down on us. I told my mother, I may have shared this with you. She said, don't you ever tell that to church where well, she's gone to heaven now. Uh, she, I, I, was, uh, I was this full of energy as a teenage boy, you know, 12 or 13. I can feel my oats and stuff, and you know, I get in there in the kitchen while she's trying to cook supper and get things ready, and, and I just always cutting up and aggravating. But one day I just went too far. I don't really know what I did, but she was peeling the potatoes out of the old long books and life like that, peeling the potatoes, and man, she just turned that thing flat ways and just popped me on the shoulders and everything. You know, it scared me. I oh, oh, you're going to cut my head off. <laughs> but at least she knew how to turn it sideways and make a paddle out of it. But, uh, you know, she was with me and, uh, and was happy to do it. Thank God. And I'm, I'm glad she did. I'm glad she did because uh, I owe a lot to her. One day I'll probably get to talk to her about it and tell her all about it. But you see, uh, there are times, down times. We have down times, but we don't have to stay down. We, we can have joy. We can rejoice. Thank God. We can rejoice because uh, maybe the Lord has allowed some things. We have, like David said, I, he strayed. He got away from God. But it, he said, I was glad that you afflicted me because before uh, I was afflicted, I'd gone astray. But he came back to God. He came back to God. So that's the main thing. We've got to stay in Christ, church. We've got to stay serving God. We, got, we can't give up. We can't give out. We've got to keep our joy and keep rejoicing unto God. I thought about the book of uh, Joshua in the very first chapter of the book of Joshua. The Bible tells us that Moses is dead. Joshua and Moses is dead. Let's look at Joshua chapter 1. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore rise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do, which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. They, they had mourned. They had been in mourning for 30 days. You look back in the book of Deuteronomy, you find that Moses had died. God had sent him on the mountain, commanded him to go up and die. Amen. The, you know, Scripture tells us that because uh, he disobeyed God and instead of speaking to the rock, he spoke to the rock the second time. He was, got aggravated, got, got in the flesh, and he spoke to the rock the second time. And uh, that was one reason that he was not able to go into the promised land. I believe that another reason he didn't go, if, if anybody would have knew where Moses' bones were, we would have, instead of Mohammed, we would have another religion that were worshiping Moses. But uh, I, I, that's my thinking. I don't have Bible to prove that, but I do have Bible to say, God said, go up on the Mount Moriah and die. You're going to die. And the angels buried him, and they, only they, know where his grave site is. But Moses was the leader. His name, Moses, meant to take out. Amen. One that was able to draw out. 
And he was God's man to bring out the children of Israel out of Egypt in a time of bondage. But now there's a new season. There's a new leader, Joshua. His name, uh, if I can say it right, you you host you Hashiach. means Jehovah is salvation. God is salvation. Praise God. So they uh, went through the time of Moses. They they worshipped God and they served God and they hated to lose that leader and they mourned for 30 days. But God said that's enough. 30 days is enough. Now it's time to get up and go over this Jordan. As we look again back at Joshua, let's look to see how that God was going to work with the children of Israel then. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now go over this Jordan. He began to tell him, said, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. We're well, reading on down a little bit in verse 6. He said, Be strong and of good courage. I believe he had joy. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land that shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swear unto their fathers to give. Only be strong and very courageous. Hallelujah. Sounds to me like I believe he was a joyful leader. His name meant God is salvation. Oh, Joshua. He's a, actually a, a form of the name Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is saved. Praise God. The Bible tells us whom the Lord loveth. He's chasing us. In the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. You might want to look over there with me a minute. Hebrews 12, verse 5 through 7. Let your conversation, oh, I'm in 13. 5 and 12, 12 and 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he received. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, amen, God deal with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Man, God's whipping you. He's ever whipped you. Rejoice. Because he's treating you like a son. He's treating you like his son or his daughter. Praise God. You know, we live in a day it's not very popular for children to be disciplined, to be spanked. It's just about outlawed everywhere. I even heard not too long ago, it was on the news, one man sued his parents. He's a full-grown man now, but he sued his parents for allowing him to be born. He said, I didn't want to be born. So he sued his mom and dad. I don't know if that ever came uh, through yet. He ever get any kind of monetary. Probably that's what it's all about, is trying to get money for nothing. But anyway, uh, uh, people having their parents arrested, for spanking them, you know, you can't harness them, you can't uh, discipline them. One man, did you see a hip of a puck of beast teeth broken last night in the other? There's one man on there, he was talking about how he uh, put on the internet that he spanked his child and he got bombarded with all kind of negative comments because he spanked his child. And uh, he said, well, the little boy is just fixing to stick a, a fork right in one of those uh, electric sockets. And he said, I didn't think it'd be a good time to say, hey, son, how do you think that's going to work for you? You know, is that going to do it? Is it going to help you? We need to talk about that. No, he said, I just slapped him on the bottom right quick. said, get away from that uh, plug-in. Don't stick no fork in the plug-in. It don't work. Hey, man. I think one of our one of our children, I believe it was a female, put a body can in one one time. But, uh, but you know, God God is correcting you. If you're out of harmony with God, if you're not in right standing with God, listen, it's important to get in right standing. 
you know, we're going to be judged. You know, I, I want everybody to go to heaven, but I don't have no heaven to give everybody. I don't want nobody to go to hell. I don't even have a hell to send nobody to. But, you know, God does. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And I need to warn you. I need to warn you if you're disobeying God, if you're going away from God instead of going toward God, uh, you're in trouble. You need to turn around. You need to repent. You need to get back right with God. If you've ever been right with God, you need to get back in fellowship with Him. Because it's, it's important. It's important. But anyway, this, uh, I told you about the Huckabee guy. You know, uh, so if God is correcting you, you know, He's a loving God. He corrects us because He loves us. Corbett and I, we, I've been batching this week. Uh, my sweetheart, I got to pick her up Tuesday in Knoxville at the airport. But Corbett and I, we've been eating out together. And Jason, we went to Cootie Brown's one time. But we was Chick-fil-A, I think Corbett and I went to Chick-fil-A the other day. I like them guys. I'm cute Chick-fil-A, they're good people. But anyway, uh, it's always crowded. And Corbett and I were standing, and Corbett had his back to it, and he didn't see it all. But there was a mom came in, had three three boys, I believe it was three boys. And they were like stair-step boys. And one this side, one this side, and one you know, not too far away from, you know, just being uh, a baby, I guess. But he's old enough to talk, old enough to walk, and uh, he probably would, uh, you might have thought he might have been a little too big to do what he did. But while they were standing there in line, he looked up at his mom and said, I want you to hold me like a baby. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and she just, Looked him up in her arm, looked him up there, you know. He wasn't like to say, he was, you know, teetering on that edge. He still, still loved that mama baby, you know. But I thought about that, how God, you know, have, we, have you ever just wanted God to pick you up and hold you up the baby? He will. He will. Praise God, because He loves you. You're His son. You're His daughter. Praise God. So you, we can rejoice. This is why we rejoice. Because we're in fellowship. In right fellowship with God. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in 1 John 3 and 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when He appears, we're going to see Him as He is. And we're going to be like Him. Praise God. He's a resurrected body. He's a glorified body. Praise God. And the Bible says we're going to be like Him. Praise God. In Matthew chapter 13, that whole 13th chapter of the book of Matthew is about, uh, about uh, parables. There's seven parables found in the 13th chapter of Matthew. The power of the seed, the sower of the seed, have a parable of the tares. You know, a parable, in this simplicity, to tell you a parable is a common story or an action, a common story or action that has a spiritual revelation or truth. When Naaman went to King David, he told him a parable. He told him about one king that had all the hundreds and hundreds of lambs and sheep how that he had a visitor and he went over and took from this poor farmer that only had one little lamb and he took that one lamb and slaughtered it and fed his guest. And David became so enraged that he said, where's Jack? We'll kill him. He was ready to come down on him and name and said, David, you're the man. He told him a parable that had a spirit of truth. And David, you know, knew that he was right. He knew that he messed up, committed adultery, committed murder, you know, by prophecy, had a, had a the man killed. But a parable is a story, a common story 
or a common action that has spiritual revelation and truth. All these, you can go down through the, all these parables, the tares, the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure. But I wanted us to look at the one about the pearl, Matthew chapter 13. And uh, let's see what, what verse we got. Verse 45, that's what it's at in the 13th chapter, 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is unto a merchant man, is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went out and sold all that he had, and he bought it. He went out and sold all that he had, and he bought it. For many years now, I mean, I've preached it this way. I've preached that, you know, Jesus is the pearl, and we're the merchant men. And we go out and we find out that there's a Jesus. We find out that there's a Savior. And we sell everything we have. We sell out. We go out of business. We go out of sin and business. And we buy that one precious pearl. But someone said something in our camp meeting this year that they turned it around and said, really, if you really look at it, there's no way you can't buy your salvation, can you? So it couldn't, wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't be fitting to think that uh, this would be us buying Jesus, buying that pearl. Jesus wouldn't be the pearl, but if you look at it from this point of view, you know, Jesus is the merchant. And the church, the body of Christ is the pearl. He went out and preached. Uh, he reached out. Someone wrote somewhere and said, if you want to know the value of anything, if you want to really know what the value of anything is, you have to find out what someone would pay for it. That makes what the value is valuable at. You know, if you want to buy a house, you can see what houses were sold for recently in the area that you wanted to buy one. You can get an average price and an idea of what the house would be worth. If you want to buy a car, you can get the, what, Kelly Blue Book, and you look in there and you can see what the car may sell for, the model, and the year, and all that things. But some things were put on auction block. Some things you put on auction block, and you really don't know what, what the price is going to be. But they keep auctioning it till somebody who really wants it. They'll pay whatever it takes to get it. Whatever it takes to get it. And this, I believe, is the real story. The story of Jesus. Amen. He's the merchant man. And he desired. You know, he, how, what did he pay? He paid, paid it all. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He came His one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. Praise God. He so loved us. He paid a great price. That's why Paul could write to the Corinthians and said, What? Don't you know that you've been bought with a price? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. I got on the internet and I, one of the preachers had mentioned of the largest pearl. And recently, I don't know how recent it is, but it's, you know, within this decade at least, I think. But the largest pearl known to us modern people. It's found in the Philippines. A fisherman found it it's in a clown, one of them giant clowns. The thing was one foot wide and 2.2 foot long, weighed 75 pounds. The fisherman got it, found it, and for 10 years he kept it in his house, kept it under the bed. He, he thought it was a good luck piece. It looked like a big old water chewing gum, so it what it looked like. It's about 2.2 foot long. 
foot wide. And he, you, he just kept it as a good luck charm. And uh, that story said that he began to move around. He had to move houses, move to another house. And he got tired of toting that thing around. He got tired of moving it. And so he decided he's going to take it to the city officials and uh, give it to them. And uh, they got it in the museum over there now, and it's valued at uh, $100 million. <laughs> Follow on the providence of the Philippines, and he had uh, that's the largest pearl they say that they know of today. But you know, Jesus paid more than a hundred million dollars. If you could put money on it, he paid with his very life. You're valuable today. You're precious to God today. Because God's paid a big price. What? Don't you know that your body is a temple of God? A temple of God. When you think about a pearl, a pearl, how it's, how it's made. You know, it's made because of a grain of sand or something that's got inside of an oyster shell or a clam shell. And it's, a, it's, it's in there. It's not, it's not natural for it to be there. And so uh, it's an irritant. It's aggravation. Jesus was pierced inside. He paid a great price for us. And he loves us. And I believe today that that gives us more and more reason to rejoice and have joy. Praise God. Remember what we talked about last Sunday? For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Remember we said, we, why can't we say it this way? For by grace are you healed through faith? And that not of yourself, for it is the gift of God. For by grace are you kept through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. All the promises of God are in Him. Yes and amen. What you are, the temple of God. And you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You should be Brother Kenny Caldell. He's a, a country and I am. And I'm kind of just torn I think. But he, he said uh, one time, preaching, he said, it ain't none of your business what God wants to do with you in this service. Because he doesn't pay the price for it. You belong to God. And if, you know, God wants to use you to walk around and praise God, why well, you just ought to do it. You feel like to do it. You're like the Lord's leading to do it. So that's what your pastor's wanting to see us realize. You know, God, I believe, want to come right down in the midst of us and do great and wonderful things and see souls saved, lives change. Praise God. Are you glad that He paid that price for you? You glad that He bought your salvation with His own blood? Will you stand with me today? Praise me unto God. Praise me unto God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. Mm -hmm. Do you love Him today? Do you realize how much he loves you? If, if you were to stand before God today and he were to ask you the question, why should I allow you into my head? What could you say? What would you say? Would you say like some? Well, we, we've done a great many things, Lord. We can heal. We just pray for people, heal for people. We witness. We, you know, we fed people. We did a lot of things. But 
he said, some people's going to say that, and he's going to say, apart from me, I never knew. It's not what we do, it's, it's what he's already done. And we got to receive him, and then we serve him because of what he's done. Amen. Our faith and our works go together. Amen. And we're getting something done for God. If you're here today and you've never realized, really, how it works. It's just a complete surrender to you for you to surrender to God. And God will take care of the rest. If you're here today and you never have taken that step, why don't you take it today? Amen. God says you're a pearl of great price. And He's paid the price for you to be the son, the daughter of God. Will you take a minute, will you take time to come to the altar today to feel the Lord dealing with your heart today, will you? Oh, blessed be God. Blessed be God. Father, we love you. Father, we get to minister in song today. Thank God. Yeah. 